Hey everyone. Oh, wow. Nope. Uh, everyone, uh, we'll get started in a second. Uh, so feel free to get your pizza and sit down. See you, Diane. Um, so hi. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, so welcome to our November meetup. Um, as always, thanks Mozilla for food and the space and everything. Um, oh, okay. uh, just one announcement, um, the Rust 2018 edition is being released soon and you should help test it. Uh, it's got all these goodies like better pads and um, eventually async await. Also Clippy is better in the edition. Yes, that's happening. Non-lexical lifetimes are happening, finally. <laughs> After years of saying it's coming, they're happening. For real this time. I promise. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have any talk ideas for future meetups, you can email me at this. Um, we have meetups here in the South Bay. We try to alternate. Um, but yeah, if you email me, I can get you up to, get you, connect you to whichever meetup you want. Um, and th today we have uh, two talks, uh, which are in the wrong order here, but uh, we are, um, we have Robert talking about flat buffers in Rust, which is a serialization framework, and we have Rafe talking about low latency music synthesis. So uh, let's give it up for Robert. No, come back. Uh, okay, I don't know how to do this. I think there's if you click on the square down there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while but since I've been on the Mac. Anyway. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Winslow. I'm going to talk to you tonight about flat buffers in Rust. But I'm going to start off with some cheesy jokes. Forgive me, I don't normally do this, but there are two of them. One, a hamburger walks into a bar. Bartender refuses, says, sorry, we don't serve food here. Yeah. All right, second one, an SQL query walks into a bar <laughs> and sees two tables. He walks up to them and says, can I join you? So I know you've just had a bunch of pizza and beer and you've had a long work day, so that's just to lighten the mood a little bit. So if I could get a show of hands, who here right now thinks that serialization is exciting? <laughs> hey, that's, that's pretty good, actually. I'm surprised. Well, I hope that I can get, convert the rest of you. So here we go. Uh, this is my hope for you at the end of the talk. You'll, have, you'll feel like this. So here's the agenda. I'm going to do a little introduction. I'm going to set the stage with a little bit of talk and opinions about serialization, explain why flat buffers exist, because there's a whole lot of other choices, how you can use it, how it works, how we test it, and then what there is still to do. My name is Robert Winslow. I'm an artific artificial intelligence product consultant. It's kind of a new thing, but it's very exciting. Uh, I've been volunteering on the flat buffers project since 2013. And before the Rust port, I wrote the Go and the Python ports as well. So I've been involved a long time. Uh, just as a sidebar, the creator of the project is actually here tonight. Wouter is back there in the corner. If, if everybody wave for him, maybe. <laughs> so what is flat buffers? Flat buffers is a high performance serialization format. Kind of the key idea is that there are no heap allocations needed anywhere, not for reading, not for writing. It's schema versioned, and it supports a lot of languages and more in the pipeline. Uh, right now we have C, C Sharp, C++, Go, Java, JavaScript, Lua, PHP, Python, Rust, and TypeScript. And this is the pull request I'm going to talk about tonight. So this was uh, 
on GitHub and we merged it on September 12, uh, 2nd, excuse me. And you can see that there's kind of a big description, got a lot of likes and party hats and stuff, so it was a very exciting day for me. Uh, and this is the only place where I show the project GitHub page, so I want to note that we crossed 10,000 stars as this pull request was being submitted, so that's kind of a big milestone for our project. And uh, on my part, this Rust port uh, was a volunteer effort, it took six months, and just for clarity, I don't work for Google. Let's talk about serialization. This is short, two sections. I'll give a definition and then some examples. A serialization format describes how to write and read data, and that's it. There are too many choices to make with this, so you can imagine any number of choices and options to choose from for how you can write data, save it in memory, save it on disk, send it over the network, read it from the network, all these different options. Um, so for concision, I'm just going to focus on three different kind of popular ones and I'll compare them. First, tried and true, we love it, we hate it. JSON, it's a plain text format, we can read it, it's human readable. Uh, out of the box, there's no schema evolution, which means that there's no way to have a standard format and then talk about a structured way to change what the data is. Take away fields, add fields. There's something called JSON schema, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, the third point about JSON is it requires parsing. And when we parse, we don't necessarily know ahead of time how, many, how much memory we're going to need. And that means we might need heap allocations. Boo. And if we want to store arbitrary binary data, like a PNG file, for example, we have to do some encoding step to make it fit into the JSON format. So a lot of people do base64 encoding, for example. Second one I'll talk about is protocol buffers. And this has really had a, a huge impact on the, the serialization landscape, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, it's a binary format, so it's not human readable. You can evolve it with the schema. And that's a useful property. It does still require parsing, though. It requires heap allocations to read the, to read the data. And unlike JSON, it's binary safe, so you can store arbitrary bytes inside of it. You can store files, whatever you want. And then choice three is flat buffers. It's also a binary format like protocol buffers. It also has schema evolution like protocol buffers. But unlike that, there's no parsing step. So there's no requirement for heap allocations. And it's also binary safe. So why do we do this? I'll introduce some ideas. Uh, mechanical sympathy is the first one. I'll give an example of how we talk about how we use integers in these different formats, why you would want to use flat buffers, and probably why you would not want to use flat buffers. Mechanical sympathy. I'll start off with this quote from the Formula One driver, Jackie Stewart. You don't have to be an engineer to be a racing driver, but you do have to have mechanical sympathy. And what he intended by this was that you need to have a gut feeling for the strengths and weaknesses of the machine you're trying to operate if you want to have a chance at using it to its full potential. How many of you have heard of this before, this idea, mechanical sympathy? Okay, not that many people. Yeah, it's, I think it's a pervasive instinct, even if you haven't heard of the term, to know how the machine operates. I make the strong claim that slow software is our fault because the machines are extremely fast. The real speed limits are billions of CPU instructions per second, gigabytes of RAM access per second, hundreds of thousands of SSD IOs per second. So if we aren't achieving that, that's our problem. It's not the hardware's problem. Hardware is great. And I think Rust philosophically is a big way that we can get there in the future where we're not already. What do CPUs want? This is the machine that we want to have sympathy for. Maybe kind of like a, we want to have an intuition or almost a feeling for it. CPUs want flat array data. They want fixed width scalars to fit in registers. They want aligned struct types. And they want data to be cache friendly, which means it's packed together. <laughs> Could we have a format like protocol buffers that's binary, statically typed, multi-language, schema versioned, just like protocol buffers, but with the additional feature of being CPU friendly, of being mechanically sympathetic to CPUs? And unsurprisingly, because I'm here tonight, the answer is yes, and flat buffers is that format. Is everybody with me so far on the justifications for this? Great. 
So the key idea behind flat buffer is the philosophy in one sentence is data should be stored on disk the way it is stored in RAM. So here I'll compare three different serialization formats, again, JSON, protobuf, and flat buffers, and give a concrete example of the requirements uh, for heap allocations in the first two. So in the left column, you can see that JSON, I describe it below as being an ASCII format, and there's an example, one, two, three, four. It's a number that's in ASCII. And the way that you get that number into a register in your CPU is you have to parse it. You have to parse it into some variable. Okay, protobuf. It uses this thing called varint, which is a uh, way to save space when you have small integers. So if you have a U32, but the only the number one is in it, you only use one byte to store it. That's a space savings, but the flip side is that because the decoding step is data dependent now, you have to do a lot of branching, and you might have to make allocations to parse that successfully. Uh, so you get space savings, but you have heap allocations. And that also is a parsing step, but it's a binary format, so it's a little bit different. Flat buffers, in contrast, uh, has little endian integers, they're always the fixed size, and the way you access them, let's say you've memory mapped this flat buffers object, is you just do a pointer dereference. That's it. It is in the wire format how it should be in the CPU. Uh, some of the use cases for flat buffers, uh, RPC calls, write ahead transaction logs. Uh, these are things that in databases when you want to commit a write as quickly as possible to your database, you append it to a log, and then you'll need to read those in quick succession to update some index or some disk data structure. And so the fewer heap allocations, the less churn you can have, uh, the better. Rendering in UIs, which I'll bring up an example in a second. Video game save files, which was actually one of the initial reasons to create uh, flat buffers because it came from a game library lab at Google. And finally, it's maybe a value format and key value stores, so you can store these in a big, uh, in index and then pull them out and you can have the structure be inside the values. So here's one example. Facebook uses it in the Android app. Um, you've probably heard of Facebook. They have a popular product. A lot of people use it. They uh, have over one billion users of the Android app. And they move from JSON to flat buffers and they decrease load time from 35 milliseconds to four milliseconds. They reduced transient memory allocations uh, by 75% and they completely eliminated that really uh, annoying effect of stutter when you scroll. So if before they had it, you would scroll quickly and it would maybe not catch quite up or it would uh, feel jagged and now it's silky smooth. So I've heard. And here's their blog post about it. And this was uh, over three years ago. So you can see the libraries had some success even before Rust came along, which is shocking, I'm sure, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, another use case, uh, so there's a successor in the works to Node.js. It has a different philosophy in a lot of ways. Um, and internally, they still use V8, but they use a lot of Rust also. And they were able to use Rust flat buffers, which just came out, and they're actually using our alpha version, which was scary for all of us involved. But the uh, they were able to rip out a lot of their C++ code and convert entirely into Rust as a result of using flat buffers in this way. They also use flat buffers in their TypeScript components and pretty pervasively all over the place. It's not perfect. Shouldn't use it all the time. A Couple of anti-use cases that come to mind. If you're storing things like trees, or tries, some people call them, or hash tables, you probably don't want to use flat buffers for that. You could probably, but it'd be awkward. Uh, sparse arrays, like we see in machine learning, very large arrays where most of them are zeros, and so you compress it that way. Not a really good fit for flat buffers. Uh, and because flat buffers has a format restriction of two gigabytes per payload, if you have huge files like videos, it's not going to be a good fit either. All right, how to use it. Uh, as an aside, I like distinguishing between how to use it and how it works. And I've noticed that all the developer marketing material will conflate the two, like, Install our thing, how does it work? It's like, no, that's not how it works. So I'll talk about how to use it and then I'll talk about how it works so you get both sides of it. First, I'll show you how to install the flat C program, write a schema, generate code, add it to your cargo file, and then have hello world. So we have uh, flat buffers in a couple of different package managers. This just shows you you can brew install it and it works just fine. 
The second thing is you can define a schema, and I'll, I'll walk through it. I apologize if not everybody can see it, but I want to show off some of the different features that we support, especially for those of you comparing to protocol buffers. So um, starting at the top left, we can declare a namespace, so we support nested namespaces. Uh, we have enum types, we have unions, we have structs, which are uh, packed data, and, and they're actually not schema versioned, but the trade-off is they're very efficient, so you could put them in a big array. Uh, going to the other side of it, we have this thing called a table, which we call a monster, and that's just a game uh, legacy from, from the beginnings of the project. Uh, and this is sort of the, the, the prime type or declaration in a flat buffer schema file is the table. And so every field there uh, can take a number of different parameters. And going from the top, we have uh, something called POS or position, which references the struct that we created on the left-hand side. So it's a three-dimensional vector where you could be in space. The next one is a uh, I, or U16 variable, which we call a short, and it has a default value of 150. And so the default values are really important because if you know ahead of time about default values for your data, you can save a lot of space. Uh, going down, we have strings. We have default values for bools, which we can deprecate uh, any field. We have a vector of bytes, and that's useful as a generic type. Uh, enum, default values, and so on. Okay. So we can use this file with the flat C compiler and the Rust flag to generate generated code. And what comes out is a pretty big file relative to the amount of data we put in the schema. So this shows that the generated file is about 500 lines, but it contains everything we need to read and write data in many different scenarios. To use it in your code, after you've generated the code from the compiler, you should add this to your cargo. Uh, we're currently at version 050. Um, I'm sure there will be a quick progression of versions uh, throughout the next 12 months uh, because this is still an early stage port. And this is the hello world. Uh, pardon the width of it, but I'll walk through it line by line quickly. So on the first line, we ex uh, import the crate, uh, which includes the runtime code. And so these are all the common functions that the generated code can call to get work done. Uh, and we load the monster generated file manually using a declaration that says the path is here. Uh, we import some things from that generated code. And then on line eight, we create what's called a builder, where this sets up uh, the state needed to create a flat buffer object. And then we use that builder uh, on line nine. We say monster create. And this was a function created in, by the code generator. And it takes a builder, and it takes something called an args struct which is a way to encapsulate the arguments you need for that particular table. And you remember the schema file had all these things in there that were, I don't know, maybe 10 fields. But here we're only giving something called HP. And that's because uh, in this Rust code, the arg struct takes default values. And so that was a, an important ergonomic development that happened pretty late in the port. On line 10, we finish it, which means we just sort of wrap up the bookkeeping for the buffer. And then on line 12, we extract the bytes. So now this is just a U8 slice. Line 14, we initialize it, so we read it as if it came in off the disk or off the network. And then finally, on line 15, uh, we can call it as a Rust object we call monster.hp function. And what that does is it makes the traversal necessary inside the data to find the value of HP. If it's not there, it might give us a default value. If it is there, it'll give us what we expect. And in this case, it should be 80. Everybody with me so far in the hello world? Great, okay. So this is the more interesting part to me as the implementer. So now we're gonna get into how it works. Um, and we're probably two thirds of the way through the talk, maybe halfway. Uh, so I wanna focus on three traits that really helped us write good code for this. Uh, the follow trait, the push trait, and the safe slice access trait. Follow and push are two sides of the same coin. Uh, follows for reading and pushes for writing. Safe slice access is an optimization. So the follow tra trait works because flat buffers are tree shaped, and we have this thing called offsets, which are like pointers. Uh, they're a little, they're always uh, 32 bits wide, but we interpret them in the same way. So it uh, tells us where to go inside of a buffer as we traverse the data. And what's interesting about the follow trait is that it allows us to interpret these offsets as type system uh, entities. And so in this way, conceptually, the follow trait lets us lift these effectively pointer dereferencing actions into the type system. 
So here's the definition of the follow trait. It's in the flat buffers crate. And you can see uh, we have one lifetime that we give it. We have an associated type called inner. And then there's just one function that's called follow. And it takes a buffer, which could be very wide, and it takes a location in that buffer. And that location, that buffer, is our offset or our pointer. And then what it returns is the associated type self inner. And so by having it return what the associated type is, and then maybe that also could have an associated type. It could be follow to, or it could be follow, and so on. We get this, uh, I'll show you in a second, a declarative chain of pointer dereferences. So this is a pretty hairy function definition, but the uh, signature is as long as the function, so that's kind of nice. But uh, the thing I want to point out is that on line two, this get function, which is used pervasively in the code, this is in the runtime library and it's uh, called in hot loops all over the place, uh, it has a trait bound of follow. And what this means is that t needs to be follow. And so that means t needs to be dereferenceable. But this function doesn't know how to dereference it. It just calls follow on line 11. The things in between, lines 7 through 10, are what allow us to get default values. Uh, and that's uh, kind of intermingled with the generated code as well. So here is how it looks in the generated code. It's a simple example. And we used HP earlier, so I'll show this again. So here we have a function marked inline. And it's, we call it HP for health points. Then it returns an i16. And here we see self.tab.get. And get was the function we just had in the other slide. But now we give it a hint. We tell it what is the type t that should have follow on it. Well, type t is i16. And we go find it in the flat buffer at offset monster vthp, which is a generated constant. And this is part of the interplay of the generated code and the runtime code. And there was a lot of architectural decisions that had to be made to make that sane. Uh, Sum 100 is the default value, and then unwrap uh, is there because we always know it will exist. So uh, in this example, i16 has follow implemented. So what that means is that at VTHP offset, there is code to uh, pull out an i16 at that lock LOC in the buffer. But here's a much more fun example. Uh, so this is test array of string, and this is a different uh, example in our test suite. So here we're talking about a a vector where each element is a, an offset into a variable length string. So it's actually a pretty complicated data structure to serialize. But we encode this in the type system. I'm not going to walk through it manually here, but every step that I mentioned about the, uh, the vector that could be variable length and inside those, the offsets to these things that could be variable length, those are all in the type system. And so that has made uh, programming this to be much more fun. And also, it feels like the compiler has my back in a way that maybe we wouldn't have in the C++ versions. So uh, I find that to be a significant innovation for the support. Any questions so far on all that? OK, cool. All right, second trait, push trait. This is the right dual of uh, the follow trait. And so this is a little more complicated. But the thing that's important is on line three, we have a function called push. And it takes in, or it is the function where a type that implements it will know how to write itself into a buffer. And then there are other things about sizing, alignment. And so this is a way for a type to uh, sort of export everything that is needed to write itself to a buffer. And we use it pervasively, again, in the uh, runtime library, this time in the builder path, the write path. And here we have one function, it's called push, and it takes a type P, which has a trait bound push on it. And you can see that X has type P, and then it returns something called a work in progress, or WIP offset of type P output. And so this is the flip side of the follow trait, where we had the input as the return value, return type. This we have the output, and so uh, there's a real dualism there. So the key, I, key thing is on line eight, where we do X dot push. And that is calling the implementation of push that X has. And so this is a way to keep the code in the right path uh, very small. And the generated code contains implementations of this for all the types that need it. So here we have a type that uh, is like the XYZ coordinates that we had earlier. So this is called VEC3. And so you can see it's implementing 
the trait flat buffers push for VEC3. It declares an output, and this is a what I would call a terminal type or a terminal push implementation where it's asking, it's saying uh, for the type VEC3, here's how you get a VEC3 as output, and that's just an artifact of how we use these as uh, types to do the traversal. And so in this case, push is using an unsafe operation to quickly mem copy itself to the provided byte buffer. Uh, as an aside, we know we can do that safely because in flat buffers, most data is little endian always. And so even on big endian machines, we store it in RAM as little endian, which means we can mem copy it as little endian onto the wire when we need to. The last trait I'll talk about is safe slice access. So this is just a dummy trait. It indicates that the host machine is little endian, and it lifts endianness into the type system. I hope that's a theme you can see. I'm trying to lift everything into the type system. Maybe I went a little overboard, but uh, I think it was a good idea. Uh, and so when this type checks, it means that it's safe to use memcopy to copy data from, say, a vector of, of bytes or structs or whatever directly into the byte buffer of the builder, the right path. Essentially, it makes the right path much more efficient when it can be by using memcopy everywhere it can. The alternative on big endian machines is that it'll uh, use different operations and might write byte by byte, for example. Okay, well, testing. So we test in uh, five and a bunch of different, five plus a bunch of different other ways. Uh, so we test for C++ and Java compatibility. We test that the code is importable. We do a lot of fuzzing round trips. We count heap allocations. We check bytes on the wire. And then we have a bunch of miscellaneous ones. Testing, C++ and Java. So uh, we're, Rust is the 12th language to be ported to flat buffers. So we wanted to make sure we comply with the things that came before us. So we could agree with the format in theory, but we also needed to agree with it in practice. And so some of the tests and the tests we will load C++ and Java generated data and check that they can read it. So here's an example from the test suite. Uh, you can see on lines 2, 7, and 12, we just have these different checks for C++ and Java in a couple of different situations. And they're all calling the same function that checks that a buffer has the right data that we expect it to. And the way the test suite works is that we have a schema that all the test suites use, or all the language ports use to test themselves. And so we can have these common uh, data payloads that we send between the language ports to check for correctness. Second thing, testing imports. Uh, generating usable code can be tricky. I mentioned that there was kind of a big blow up factor when we're generating code compared to the size of the schema and getting all that right with namespacing and modules and public and private types and lifetime constraints uh, can be error prone. And so to just absolutely make sure that that's working as we need it to, we take a black box approach to testing. So we, in our test suite, the entire test suite file, which is thousands of lines long, we begin by importing our generated code using the same way that you would as a user. So we extern our own crate and we load in the generated file uh, using the mechanism that you've seen a few times throughout the talk. Third thing, fuzzing, fuzzing round trips. Uh, so flat buffers is a library for reading and writing data. So what are all the cases we could test? Mm, you can't really test all cases because the users are providing the input. And so we use an approximation of all input called quick check, which tries to create uh, exemplary test cases that we can use to test a wide variety of edge conditions. Uh, and when there's an error, quick check will hone down and find sort of the minimum violating example so that it's easy to debug. Uh, so we use that all over the place in the test suite. Third thing, counting heap allocations. In theory, the flat buffers format doesn't require any heap allocations, but do we actually do that? Maybe we have a VEC hidden somewhere, something like that. Um, so as of Rust 1.28.0, we actually can use a custom global allocator in a separate program to verify that we aren't making any heap allocations on hot paths. And so this is the critical section. So on line one, we're creating a static global variable called n alex, and it starts off at zero. We follow just the documentation for creating a basic allocator here. So uh, two is a tracking allocator. It's our name for it. We implement one function on it, which returns the number of allocations that it see, has seen so far in the program. 
And then on lines 10 through 18, we implement pass-through functions for allocation and deallocation with the caveat that on the allocation path, we increment that global n allocs variable. And then on test time, we pull out the n allocs value and assert that it has stayed the same as it was before the test was executed. And so this is how seriously we take performance in the flat buffers project, that we're trying to use features as soon as they're put into stable to make sure that we're as fast as we possibly can be. Um, I'll talk more about speed and maybe the potential for that later. Uh, the next test, bytes on the wire. Uh, so Rust code should generate exactly the bytes we expect. Uh, there is technically a little flexibility in how the different ports can create data, uh, but we try to stick to the common ways that it's been done before for maximum uh, sort of bug, you know, being able to sleep well at night that you don't have bugs in your code. Uh, and also these tests are really good for new contributors because you can see concretely what the byte layout is on the wire format uh, and kind of bridge the gap between the schema, the generated code, the runtime library, and then finally what is on the wire, what's on disk, what's in RAM. So here's an example. Uh, the idea is that it's a test function that stands alone and there is one utility function called check. And so lines three through seven create data. They set up some situation in all these different test cases, uh, write some data. And then uh, we're done writing, and on lines 8 through 16, we call this check utility function that verifies that the data that was written to the byte buffer is exactly what we expect. And so in the comments, there are actually often descriptions of what the numbers mean. And so these are, that's an implementation detail of the format itself, but if you're interested in getting involved in the project, this serves as a very precise form of documentation. Miscellaneous testing, uh, we have 191 tests in the test suite and growing. Uh, we test data alignment and sizing. Uh, we check various borrow checker situations. So for example, we had an issue recently with uh, flat buffers that were used with data that had static lifetimes. It wasn't working and so we fixed that and now we're checking it in the test suite. Uh, we have many, many tests for the different major types in flat buffers such as tables, structs, vectors, unions, enums, scalars and also uh, many tests for the traits that I mentioned earlier, including follow and push. Uh, finally, future work. There's a lot still to do. Uh, first thing is that we would like to implement what's called a verifier. So Rust, C, and C++ and flat buffers are unique because they're able to uh, do unsafe things with memory, which you know in Rust land we don't really like, but in this case, we can justify it if we can implement a verifier that uses a, an already known algorithm to double check that the offsets don't go out of bounds. And that's a very quick process and we know that from C++ already. And so once we can have that in Rust, then we're free to do even uh, more aggressive unsafe usage because we know it won't go out of bounds at runtime. And this also lets you use untrusted data. The second thing is that uh, flat buffers has support for the mutation of values. So if a space is already allocated in a buffer, then you can overwrite those bytes with a value that fits. And the Rust for, uh, port does not yet support that. We hope to soon. The third thing is reflection. Uh, so in the C++ port, it's possible to uh, evaluate metadata at runtime. We'd like to be able to do that in Rust as well. Uh, five, extreme fuzzing. This one's pretty exciting to me. As you can tell, I like testing, so this is the next level. Extreme fuzzing would be a situation where we can generate whole flat buffer schemas randomly, maybe using quick check. We can generate data that complies to that schema that we haven't seen before, serialize it, deserialize it, and then check that the values we get out are the same as what we put in. And so that would be a complete round trip from write to read. And then there's something else we could do where we go even further and we do writes and reads through all these different languages and make sure that the game of telephone comes back how it should be at the beginning. Uh, and then finally, uh, six, we haven't really done any benchmarking, uh, no real attempts to speed things up in a rigorous way. Uh, we're already pretty fast, but I think we can be a lot faster. And so this is just the beginning, and if you all are willing to uh, dig in, uh, we have a lot of really helpful mentoring maintainers uh, and contributors, and I, I hope you uh, take a look at the project. Uh, three final thoughts. Uh, one, there are network effects with serialization formats. So the more people who like it, who use it, who are happy users, the more people who 
use it for storing data, the more people use it for sending and receiving messages. Uh, the network effect there means that the format will grow in usage. And that's one of the reasons that the, there's a, it's hard to dislodge existing serialization formats. It's like the social network of data storage. So uh, we hope to make users happy so that we can grow. Uh, the second thing is that uh, flat buffers, and to me, represents an optimum where uh, it's, it's got the features of protocol buffers, but it's also got mechanical sympathy. It's CPU friendly. It has all these properties that make it very fast, and I would argue probably as fast as can be for what it provides. And then finally, uh, and I, I know my audience, so I think that Rust and flat buffers have the same values. Uh, and that's to be very careful with types in memory to achieve safe zero runtime uh, high performance software. Zero overhead high performance software. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So do, we have, do we do the mic thing? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you said hash maps aren't a good map, good, good uh, pattern. You could probably figure out a clever way to do it. It's okay. not something we support. Because, you know, half my structs have hash maps. Right. Uh, what about hash sets? So uh, the way I'll answer that is that uh, I believe the C++ port supports this, and maybe Wouter can speak to it. But there's limited uh, support for a key value okay. operation, which might be what you need. Yep. OK. And then you can deserialize it how you want it in memory. And I'll just note that whatever the hash map or hash set that you're using, that doesn't map to what the wire format would be. It's not necessarily memory mappable. Yeah, I don't care about that so yeah. much. Yeah. But just being able to use it. Sure. So the C++ port and some other ports, oh, thank you. Uh, they support uh, in-place binary search, so it's not a hash map, but certainly for doing some kind of dictionary kind of structure. Uh, and the cool thing is, like much of the rest of flat buffers, like you don't actually have to build up a binary tree first. It works directly on the stored data. So if a binary tree search is fast enough for you, then this will be a great solution. Why should we use flat buffers instead of the Rust port of Cap'n Proto? Oh, oh. Uh, this, um, <laughs> this comes up a lot. I, uh, I, we, we like the Cap'n Proto project. Uh, I think that there are uses for both of them. Uh, in my estimation, and I'm not an expert on Cap'n Proto, and I am on flat buffers, so I'm biased and I have a biased knowledge base. But the, uh, some of the things that I understand flat buffers give are uh, one of the major things in Cap'n Proto is this idea that there are a lot of zeros, and so you can do run length compression of zeros on the wire, and that that's beneficial. And it is if you're willing to decompress your data on the other side. But the whole premise that we've been talking about is that data should be OK as is. We want to memory map it. We want to load it with no overhead. And so if you take away that extra decompression step that Cap'n Proto sort of requires to get a lot of those benefits, um, that's one example of how flat buffers might be preferable. Um, but again, I don't want to speak too much to it because I'm not an expert in how to compare them. I just them. have a comment on yeah. Cap'n Proto. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Cap'n Proto is, the uh, cap in Cap'n Proto is capability, so it's capability friendly. Speaking from personal experience using the Cap'n Proto uh, Rust port, it's got a lot more error checking going on. So if you're actually dealing with the buffers, um, this looks a lot more friendly to actually using flat buffers like if you're writing a game, this looks a lot more friendly to you actually using flat buffers to store parts of your game state, and in so making it easier to save that to disk. But if you're using Captain Proto, it's it's not so friendly to that. If you're reading from it, there's a lot of error checking to go on when you're actually taking out values, and so you find yourself doing a lot of unwraps and run. From what I've seen, for example, in .hp call, it does the unwraps for you. So it seems like it would be a lot more convenient to use in that particular case. So you're talking about developer ergonomics with that? Yes, yeah. which is very important to me. <laughs> I, want to give a, I want to give a shout out to the creator of Cotton Proto because uh, my understanding is that he uh, was crucial in creating protocol buffers. And we owe a huge intellectual legacy tradition to that. So uh, I don't really see it as a competition. I see it as an ecosystem where we can learn from each other. 
not to be too diplomatic about it, but you know. <laughs> For what it's worth, um, I use Cap and Proto with an additional essentially parsing step. I'll actually extract things and then turn that into my in-memory structure rather than just using it in place okay. because of this. So if that fits your use case, then so be it. Great. Uh, do you have a lot of examples of people using um, flat buffers for FFI between two languages? Um, Rust mm. and Python, for example? The only major one I know of is the Deno project that I mentioned earlier. So they're using it to, uh, so they have a runtime that's in Rust and C++ and also TypeScript and JavaScript or something. It's pretty complicated. But to make all that tolerably efficient, they use flat buffers as the RPC in these very hot loops between things. Um, besides that, I'm not familiar with many other projects, but I bet they're out there. Oh, and also, uh, bigger picture. GRPC added support for flat buffers and I think in Go. So uh, that's an example of cross-platform usage. It's pretty major. You mentioned um, checking for allocations in hot pass. Is that to imply you still have a, uh, allocation happening in other places? There are three ways allocations can happen in the, in the right path. The first one is when the builder itself has a set of bytes that it uses as scratch space. When that is at capacity, no more allocations happen. So it will regrow and then you can reuse that data over and over again. No more heaps in steady state operation. Uh, the second way is that we have a utility function called gr create vector of strings. And I mentioned earlier that a vector of strings is a bunch of variable length, nested variable length data. And so inside there we use a package called smallvec, which unsafely puts vectors of things on the stack if it can and then on the heap if it can. And so that's the place that heaps can, heap allocations can occur. The third way is through you creating data. So the references that the builder gets, they need to come from somewhere. And so if you make a string, for example, uh, that might be heap allocated. And so at that point, if you're creating things in a hot loop along with the flat buffers code, it's not technically flat buffers problem, but it is your problem, and so it's part of the same situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'll say on the read path, there really are no allocations required. I can do this all night. Really excited <laughs> about serialization. <laughs> We're good. We're good. Thank you. This is a really awesome project, and I'm really glad you brought this to Rust. I missed a few of the questions, so this might have already been covered. But I saw that during writes, you like to use mem copies whenever you possibly can. You showed an example of mem copying an entire vector at once. And I'm wondering how flat buffers accounts for uh, padding and structs, mm -hmm. whether it thinks about that and does anything special for it. Uh, so one cool technique about implementing this was that that actually gets handled by the flat C compiler. So when it emits code to describe a field and a struct, for example, it'll say field A is a U16 or whatever, and the next field is whatever. And then it actually outputs manually. They're, they have underscores at the beginning, and they're not for users to use. But we actually have the padding defined explicitly in the struct type. Yeah, and that way we're not leaving it up to, you know, uh, what are they called when you have the pound sign and then above a struct, those attributes? We're not leaving it up to that. Um, I noticed that in your generated code examples, you have a lot of the inline attributes. Um, did you find that it's often necessary to add those, or do you just add them just in case? So... I started off without them, because there's this idea that LLVM is sufficiently smart. Um, and I'm not a compiler expert, but I know somebody who is, and that's Wouter. And one piece of wisdom he gave me is that when you start suggesting inlines, note that I don't say inline always, I just say inline, so it's a suggestion. When those start, when the compiler starts agreeing to those suggestions all over the place, it can start collapsing code together and start doing optimizations that have a compounding effect. And so I anecdotally noticed that when I added inline to all those things, and all these different places where they can show up generated code, library, all that stuff, uh, that 
the runtime sp uh, sped up quite a bit, um, uh, sometimes even doubling in speed from, say, like 500 nanoseconds to 250 nanoseconds or something like that. I'm nervous every time now. <laughs> so Rust is interesting in that the string type guarantees that your data is UTF-8. Yes. Flat buffers looks like it has a string type. How is that interop handled? So I believe that when we implement the verifier, we'll be checking that. Is that true? OK. But we could. We could do that in the verifier. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Uh, the way that it's handled in general in the project is that the language natively that writes the data should know that it's a UTF-8 string, and so it should be writing the correct data. And then so on the read side, we can, you know, assuming that you trust the source, can just cast it to, say, a UTF-8 string. Uh, but yeah, I think you just gave us another feature um, to, to, to work on for, for the verifier. Here we go. Thanks. Uh, were you able to use some interesting things with like borrow checker? So flat buffers, like you essentially have memory, uh, you know, view to data. So like you could do mirroring or like without even copying. Like it seems that, for example, if I want to pull a string from the flat buffer, I'm still actually, do I get a slice of it or like do I copy the bytes? Do I get a view on it? Uh, so the the slice uh, descriptor, the reference and the length, that is copied and put on the stack. But the okay. memory that it points to is in the flat buffer. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's uh, done on safely. Does how that answer the, your question? Yeah, yeah, that, okay. that, that answer is. And uh, how does it work with like the fact that you want to make flat buffers mutable later? Oh, yeah. So uh, I haven't added that. Uh, to any of the ports, so I'm not an expert on it. Uh, my understanding is that we would have to have a, probably quite a bit of separate code paths where we add mute to things uh, to allow users to change data. Um, in other languages, it's easier. Like in C++, you can just get a pointer, and there you go. But here we need <coughs> mute and non-mute references. Uh, so that's still TBD. Mm -hmm. And, and like again, if you all want to begin contributing, this, these are cool. These are great. And like for simpler types, like integer, would yep. it be also pointing to exact same memory, or would you actually copy it? it just curious. So uh, because the pointer would just be pointing to the buffer that stores the flat buffer data, I'm using buffer twice. I mean the U8 buffer that backs the flat buffer data. So you get a pointer into that, and you know that at that location, there are you know one, two, four, eight bytes that represent some number. And so by on the read path, we just you know, if, it, if you're on a little Indian machine, then you just get that value directly, just a pointer dereference. Uh, but hmm. if you want to write to it, that means you can just do, in C land, you would just do a dereference equals to set that to a new value in that memory. And then to persist that, you would just copy that memory back out and send it along to your destination. So it's sort of like a, it's exa it would be exactly like a read-write memory map. I see that you're not quite convinced. Yeah, yeah, well, well I mean, uh, I'm just thinking about this scenario where imagine I have like, I don't know, like a gigabyte of a flood buffer, like single flood buffer that is like very large. And then because I'm not pulling the data off it to mm -hmm. my stack properly, I'm just like looking at and like switching the, the pointer on it, right? Uh, it could theoretically actually decrease the performance, right? Because it doesn't lay into the cache properly. Because it could be anywhere, like it could be defragmented in this large flood buffer, right? So, yeah. like, so I would say that the sparse nature of the updates that you're talking about making won't be cache friendly. If it helps with understanding the ergonomics of it, I put up the example of the the easy version of uh, use of the follow trait, where we have the i16, and so underneath this is using follow to dereference and get out the i16. Mm -hmm. And so we would have probably follow mute. 
and there would be corresponding functions for all the available slots uh, where we would say HP set, for example. Okay, kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, um, just to reiterate, uh, the principle of flat buffers wants to lay things out on the wire like they are in RAM. So these numbers are on the wire like they are in RAM. And so when we load them, you can uh, manipulate them using just pointers. Right, right. But, but then you don't, the way your data is in RAM and your program is different from how you structure it. Like it's, it could be a very complicated object, right? Oh, Which yeah. So sometimes you only want like different parts of it, but mm -hmm. because you look at it like as a whole, you kind of have to jump around the memory just to look at these like individual fields, right? Yeah, let's, let's talk afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. That'd Thanks. be great. Cool. So uh, I think I've been up here a while, so are there any other questions? Maybe we should call it? Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, and next we have Rafe. Got kind of a lot of stuff here. <laughs> is that like an Ableton or something? That is a small oh, yeah. mini keyboard, and then uh, pr no, probably not. I don't think that I don't think that helps me. And then I do want to plug in the power because this can. Uh, Um, great. So I am Rafe, uh, Rafe Levine. Uh, I actually um, was at Google for a while, uh, but have just in the last couple of months or so gone out on my own to create a video game. And a major component of this video game, kind of the core mechanic, is a music synthesizer. So I'm building that pretty much from scratch in Rust, and most of this talk is going to be kind of about the details of what I'm doing in building that synthesizer and kind of why it's interesting. So I've been interested in audio synthesis for a very long time. When I was a teenager, I had a PCAT computer uh, with an 8286 chip in it, and one of the things I built, uh, wrote on that computer is a drum machine. And so it had this kind of simple rendering loop where you'd go in and had four voices of polyphony and the render loop would just kind of fetch four samples of data from RAM add them together and then use this out OX378 instruction which put it out over the parallel port to which a 8-bit uh, digital to analog converter uh, was attached. And so kind of one of the interesting things about that code, especially comparing it to the way you would write audio code today, is that the amount of time through that loop was completely consistent that on an 8286 processor, you didn't have caching branch prediction, you didn't have specter or meltdown, um, you know, that every instruction took like a certain number of clocks to execute. And so the total amount of time through that loop would be the same every uh, sample. And then in terms of like, how do you respond to input? Like when you press a key, what happens? There'd be an interrupt and then that would like twizzle the pointers to, you know, set the the, you know, the pointer to, to a read from the correct sample. So when you look at the performance of this, you know, the throughput is, by today's standards, almost laughably small, that uh, that particular code was not using floating point, because the, the floating point performance at that time was 50 kiloflops, so you don't even have time to do like one or two floating point instructions per sample. So use fixed point, but even the fixed point performance was not great. But the latency was incredible because there was basically no buffering, no sources of latency, that as soon as you press that key, it would do an interrupt and it would start playing directly from that point. So one of the ways of looking at that performance is like a histogram of how long does it take to go through one cycle of that processing loop. And like even this is like, uh, the reality is even tighter than this, that that, that uh, peak is like really narrow and it's basically right up on the deadline that it's taking 
the full amount of the CPU available for each um, cycle in, in the render. Now, when you look at code running today, code running today is optimized for throughput. So this is a much more typical histogram, that you have this nice peak with this you know, uh, mean, which represents throughput. You're, you, when you're measuring throughput, it's all about the mean of this distribution. Uh, but then you've got this tail. And if you've got a deadline, you know, when you're generating audio, you have to generate a certain number of audio samples, and you have to get that done in time for that buffer to be output to the physical uh, digital to analog converter on the device. And if you miss that deadline, you get a glitch. So kind of the obvious thing to do is we'll just move the deadline now. Just, you know, just make it long enough so that the probability of those glitches happening uh, is really small, but that's unsatisfying. I want to achieve low latency and high performance. So why does it have this shape? Why, why does it have this kind of nice clean peak but then this long tail coming out? And the answer is that there are low probability events that take a long time. Now they, they can't be high probability events because that would affect throughput. You would notice it and people you know, really care about throughput a lot. But when you're doing audio, you care about these low probability events. So if you're loading something from the file system, obviously that can take a lot of time. So you don't want to do that on the audio rendering um, thread. Um, another sort of trickier, more subtle problem is that you might be holding a mutex, that a mutex is kind of the standard way of communicating between two different threads in your program. And you, know, you generally want to have shared state, and you want to have a mutex to say, OK, I get to write this state in my UI, and then I get to read the state in my audio processing. And if you just happen to be blocking on that mutex, at the t you know, if the UI is holding that mutex at the time that the uh, audio reads it, then you can block, and that can take a lot of time. So one of the things that gets really tricky is that allocation is a source of blocking. And so this twisty symbol, I'm going to put the twisty symbol on the slides to indicate places where the reality is a little bit more complex than the simple story, because there is such a thing as real-time allocation, but that's pretty specialized. That's pretty, um, uh, that's actually not the solution um, that, uh, where I'm going to go with this. And so you have to be really careful that any code that calls any other code that does any of this other stuff that could possibly block has this potential of creating this tail. And, uh, and making you miss your deadline and getting a glitch. So as I say, like a very typical, like if you look at a typical game, it'll just have a nice couple hundred milliseconds buffer and you know, the probability of those glitching um, is really small. So this great uh, blog post by Ross Bencina called Time Waits for Nothing. And I, you know, I high, highly recommend uh, reading that for more detail, but you know, to kind of get the highlights of this, um, uh, what can you do? Like, there are techniques where you can render your audio in real time, get really good performance, but you have to be pretty careful about it. So the main thing is that your operating system has a mechanism to schedule your thread real time. You can always, that's another source of these blocking events is that your thread is ready to run, but your operating system just hasn't scheduled it. So most operating systems have a way of doing your audio so that the processing of that audio is happening on a real-time thread. And when it's time to generate those audio samples, that thread will get scheduled. And so kind of going through Windows, it used to have this thing called ASIO drivers, which were kind of proprietary. Now it's kind of part of the standard system called Wasapi. Uh, Mac OS and iOS have a very solid system called Core Audio. Uh, that's very good about scheduling real-time threads. And then Android's been evolving. It, it's had open SLES for several years. Now it has a new thing called A-Audio, which, which is much, much higher performance, much lower latency. And all of these things are basically you know, ways of running your application-specific code on the real-time thread at exactly the time is needed to generate that audio. So already we're finding a problem in the Rust ecosystem that, that there's a cross-platform audio layer called CPAL, and it's inconsistent. Like on Mac OS and iOS, it does run your audio code on the real-time thread, but on other systems like Windows and Linux, it doesn't. And so there's an open issue for that, and that's kind of one of the places where I think we need a little bit of community investment in making this infrastructure suitable for this high-performance audio processing. 
So once you solve this problem of getting your operating system to schedule your thread, you still have the responsibility that your code does not have any sources of blocking. So your code has to have no mutexes and no allocations. Um, so this forces the choice of a weight-free algorithm or a there's different words for it, and like the difference between weight-free and lock-free is very subtle, which is why I've got another one of those bendy symbols. But the main thing is you can't use a mutex to get state from one thread into the other, to get state from the UI into the audio processing. And so you have to use one of these weight-free data structures so that your audio rendering thread can access that state, uh, whatever state is available at that time. Uh, so under the hood, it's using an atomic operation to, to get that data across. So there's a lot of different kinds of lock-free data structures. There's a, a big literature on this. Uh, and the kind of core data structure that we need is a queue. So we basically want to be sending things into that queue from the UI thread that the audio thread is going to be consuming. And so queues come in a lot of flavors. Um, most popular in audio is actually a fixed size array, a ring buffer. But there's other types. There's a linked list variant. And then there's other choices about whether you're going to have multiple producers and consumers or whether it's just going to kind of be one producer, one, one consumer. And you know, a theme here is weight-free algorithms are really tricky. It's very difficult to get them correct. It's very easy to get an, a concurrency error in the implementation, and it's also quite difficult to analyze their performance. And so um, for lots more information, Dmitry Vukov has a great page. Uh, the one on uh, lock-free queues is linked here, and it's got a ton more information. So about six years ago, uh, I built uh, another synthesizer uh, called uh, Music Synthesizer for Android. And this is the engine in DexEd, which is a fairly popular uh, um, plugin for digital audio workstations that, um, that does uh, synthesis. It emulates the Yamaha DX7, so it's doing FM synthesis. And you know, I kind of talk about this as being Fortran style. So you allocate all of the state of the synthesizer in advance in a fixed size array. And in the case of uh, emulating a Yamaha DX7, that's a synthesizer from, I think, 36 years ago. So from a day where state was counted in bits. So the entire state of the synthesizer is, I think, 200 bytes. So it's not difficult to allocate this in advance. And then you use um, you know, a, a ring buffer to get data from the UI or from the keyboard into the audio generation. And there's no return channel. This is fairly simple, like from an uh, architectural point of view. This is a really simple, basic uh, structure. So the performance is really great. One of the reasons, one of the motivations for doing this was to stretch the uh, abilities of Android audio performance. And so I went pretty deep into that and did some things to improve the performance of audio on Android. Gave a talk uh, at Google I.O. Um, five years ago. So the performance was great, but it's very limited. It can do a Yamaha DX7, but there's a lot of other stuff that it can't do. And what I want to be building today is something that has a lot of dynamic behavior. I want to do not just FM synthesis, but like a very large range of different synthesis techniques and different structures and different ways of putting these modules together. So when I am creating audio, I want to be able to instantiate new modules. I, I have a graph of audio processing, and I want to be able to patch those modules into the graph, change the wiring around. I might want to have large uh, data sets that are loaded from uh, disk that contain audio samples or other, uh, other information that I want to access during synthesis. And uh, you know th these might be in complex data structures. I don't want to be forced to put these in like a Fortran style array that are that are allocated uh, before you um, before you start processing. So there's a lot of code out there. Like most audio code is written in C++ these days, and there's a lot of code that is like pulling data from one thread and setting data in another thread. And what can possibly go wrong? So I pulled this video. There's actually a bunch of videos. Uh, showing crashes of digital audio workstations. And I, I picked this one. Uh, you'll, you'll see. I uh, had this problem this time. Click. All right. I um, just want to show you in an example what the issue seems to be. Um, when I open the Mini V2, and it, it's a bit the same for all, of the, uh, for all of the synths. If you see this here, this is already flickering. Tick, tick. And if I try to, well, it's fine. But if I try to change this here, 
to a different preset, usually it will crash. So I click here, it's not reacting, as you can see. And uh, well, well, it's not it's not reacting now, or it will crash. So there you go, it's gone. Here you can see the uh, failure. It is a hey, that's new. It's exception bad axis. Before that, it was a uh, Kern invalid. So if you could please give me some advice because I spent 200 bucks yesterday on the uh, pack would be great uh, if I wouldn't have. So I because it shows basically all of the features of undefined behavior that it's inconsistent, like it works a bunch of the time, but some of the time it's failing. And then when it does fail, is it what, you know, uh, surprise me, is it going to be a seg fault? Is it going to be something else? Um, so, so this is pretty common, unfortunately, and like there's actually a lot of work going on in like sandboxing into processes uh, to try and you know make it so you don't lose all of your work when this happens. Um, and uh, you know, like part of the work, part of what's motivating the work that I'm doing is let's do this in Rust and let's use like proper type safe uh, uh, approaches. Let's use a lock free queue that we have a very high confidence is actually working correctly and put the right send and sync traits on it so that it's not going to just um, create undefined behavior, uh, which you know, can have these uh, really negative consequences for real, real world users. Um, there we go. So this is kind of an overall architecture of the engine that I'm building. And so the main idea here is splitting the work into two different threads. So there's a real-time thread, which is what's being run by the operating system to generate audio samples, and there's also an engine thread. And so the idea is that anything below that dotted line, the allocation is completely forbidden. And actually, one of the ideas I'm going to steal from the flat buffers talk is testing that, that I want to put a global allocator in place that looks at like you know maybe a thread local storage to say, am I running in the audio callback? And then if it is, then it says, uh-oh, if you're doing an allocation or a free, then I want to be able to um, signal that because you really want to completely forbid any source of allocations on the real-time thread. But you still want to be able to allocate data structures. You still want to be able to have all this dynamic behavior. And kind of the idea that I have is that you create those data structures in this engine thread, and then you send them to the real-time thread through a lock-free queue, and then all of the processing, the way that those structures are consumed by the real-time thread is by swapping. So if you've got a new module that's replacing an old module, then you swap that into place, and then you take that old module and you send it back up through the lock-free queue to the return channel, where it'll actually get deallocated in the engine thread. So you need to make sure it's not just allocating, it's deallocating too, that all of that stuff is outside the real-time thread. And then the return channel is also useful um, because that contains your monitoring information, that contains your waveform that you might be visualizing in an oscilloscope. So, you know, the idea is to kind of have a lack of constraints on what happens in the engine thread and a lack of performance problems in what happens in the real-time thread. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about these lock-free queues, because you might say, oh, lock-free queue, that's great, Rust has that. What about MPSC Chan or Crossbeam? And those are good lock-free queue designs, but there is a problem, which is that when you take something out of the lock-free queue, it's in a kind of a wrapper, sort of a box-like container, and it can drop that box-like container when you pull something out of the queue. And I want to have this rigorous um, non-blocking, which means no allocating uh, processing. So I'm going to roll a new lock-free data structure from scratch. And ordinarily, that's a fairly scary concept. But I'm going to use one of the simplest lock-free data structures that exists, which is the Triber stack. And this is based on a linked list. Like another approach to this would be say, OK, I'm going to use a fixed size array. But there's already a problem with that, that um, you know, if I had a fixed size array for the data going from the engine to the real-time thread, it would be okay if the array is full, then I can block and wait until like there's space available. But for the return path, I can't really do that 
that when the real-time thread needs to send a data structure back to the engine, that needs to succeed every single time and never block. And so that's motivating these unbounded or linked list based uh, lock free queues as opposed to using an array. So the Triber stack is basically a linked list with a kind of an atomic, um, you know, um, flavor. And uh, so it's unbounded that I can just keep pushing onto it. And the, we, in this particular case, we care about two operations that the Triber stack can do. And one of them is push one, push, put one piece of data onto the stack, and the other is take all. And this structure is really good for a multiple producer, single consumer queues. So you've got like many potentially different threads pushing data onto the stack, and then you've got one thread, which is like your audio engine that's pulling stuff uh, out of the queue. So let's look at these two operations. Uh, push one is a compare and swap operation. So you basically read the atomic pointer, and that gets you the top of the current top of stack, and you set the link. So these are boxes with like a good way of thinking about this is it's a box with one extra pointer, your next pointer, and like a good reason to think about these as boxes specifically is that we're going to keep them around. We're going to when we're using these data structures, so they deref just like a box. So we're going to keep these containers around in the audio engine because we can't strip them off. We need to keep them so that we're able to, to not do any allocation or deallocation on them. So there's kind of a box with this extra next pointer. We read the top of stack, we set that next pointer, and then we do a compare and swap. So if there's no contention on this, then it just becomes the new state, it pushes it onto the stack. If somebody, if some other thread mutated that in the meantime, which can happen, we got to worry about these kind of concurrency races, then what happens is that the compare doesn't match, that the new state of the atomic pointer does not match the, um, uh, the, uh, the state that we expected it, and therefore we retry it, and we keep, keep retrying until it succeeds. So the other operation that TriberStack has, or that we're using in this case, is take all. And in this one, we swap a null pointer. And so the before state has you know, a list of three items. And in the after state, the list is empty. And then we have those items. And then we do a reverse in place, because those were pushed in sort of last in, first out order. But we want to get the modules out in uh, first in, first out order. So we do a reverse in place. And like. Maybe like you have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, you've heard a complaint about interview questions about like, why would I ever need to reverse a linked list in place? And you know, kind of the answer is if you're building this infrastructure, you do need to do it because you can't like allocate temporary storage for this thing. Uh, you've got to use the allocations that you've got and that means doing the reverse in place. But hopefully to use these crates, like, you know, I'm really kind of advocating a fearlessness that you can take these modules and put them together and think about your audio algorithm that you're trying to accomplish instead of think about, you know, how to do lock-free programming. But I think it helps to have a little maybe mechanical sympathy for how it works under the hood. Um, so, so that's kind of the lock-free structure around this. And then once you have these modules that are in this graph, it's doing a, a uh, traversal topological sort of the modules in that graph and then for each one of those modules it's calling this process method and this part of it is actually fairly straightforward that it's the process function just takes a bunch of buffers in and a bunch of output buffers and each module is just expected to you know read read the data do some processing generate some output and leave that in the output buffers but one kind of interesting thing about this uh, particular trait is that there's this migrate method. And what the migrate method does is that if you swap out a module, you know, a new module to replace an old module, the migrate method is a place where they can kind of connect and share state with each other. So you give it the old module, and then it's got this to any bound on the trait. So you can actually get an any, which is one of, you tend to think of Rust as having this very static uh, type system, but it has these escape hatches that allow this kind of dynamic 
loosely coupled behavior, and any is one of those. So you can query it and say, are you this module? Do you have this particular type? And if that succeeds, then you can take data and you can do things like swap it or combine it so you can like retain some of the state um, that's, that's in your module. And, and these can be complicated data structures. They can be hash maps. They can be uh, you know, anything. The only restriction is that what you're allowed to do in the audio thread is that you can swap. You can't insert into a hash table because that might allocate. But you can do that allocation in your engine thread, and then inside this migrate method, you can still access that data just as long as you make sure that you're, you're really only using swap to do those mutations. Um, so then another method that's here that's kind of important is that a lot of time you're just setting a parameter. Like if you've got one of these controller knobs, then those are going to be just a lot of calls to uh, set param on this audio processing trait. So you can you know, change things like filter, cutoff, and so on. So when you're implementing one of these modules, you're very concerned about making the audio processing as fast as possible. And one of the things that you reach for is single instruction, multiple data instructions, or vector processing instructions. And these are a perfect grain of computation for audio, because generally when you're doing audio the way I'm doing it, you're, you're dealing with chunks that are maybe like 64 samples long. And if you're dealing with like um, hundreds of thousands or millions of samples like an image, you kind of don't want to be doing that on a CPU, on a modern uh, machine. You want to be doing those in GPU. But like just getting a, something started and stopped, it's not worth doing on the GPU if it's only 64 samples. But on the other time, you don't want to be doing it one at a time because that adds up. And so SIMD is like this kind of perfect balance. And you get these uh, you know, you have uh, a lot of the algorithms that I've been experimenting with, you get an, a four times or an eight times or even larger speed up using the SIMD capabilities of the machine. And fortunately, like Rust has uh, SIMD. It's in stable Rust. You can write this code. But can we call it fearless? Not, not just yet. So why is SIMD unsafe? If you write SIMD using standard Rust, then all of your SIMD code has to be in unsafe blocks. And why is that? Like, if I multiply two F32s together, that's, that's not unsafe. That's fine. But if I have a vector of four of them that I want to uh, multiply together, that's unsafe. Why is that? So the real story is complicated, but basically the SIMD capabilities vary extremely widely from chip to chip, even within a single architecture family. So you've got, like today, you've got a lot of things that are out there that are 128 bits wide. Um, most 64-bit uh, x86 machines are at 256-bit wide register. And then the very newest, just in the last year or so, we have uh, 512 bits wide. And then there's, it's not just the width of the registers and like how, how much data it can process. It, there's also differences in what instructions are available. So in newer Intel chips, there's these masked instructions that can only operate on part of the data and they're like safe, like for example, if you do a, a masked read and it's, you know, like you only have three elements uh, in the buffer but the mask only specifies those three, that, that's safe to do. So if you generate code that has these SIMD instructions embedded in it and that particular SIMD instruction is not supported by the chip, then hopefully you get a crash. It's undefined behavior. You're not allowed to do that. And that's the, that's the main reason why SIMD instructions are unsafe. So what you really want to do, especially if you're shipping a binary, if you're shipping a game or a synthesizer, is that you want to compile that so that there's multiple versions that represent those different levels of capabilities of different chips. And then at runtime, you want to detect, oh, I'm, I'm running on a Haswell, so that has AVX2, and so I want to run the AVX2 code. Or no, I'm running on an older machine, and so I'm going to, you know, in the worst case, maybe go to a scalar fallback. Maybe there's no available SIMD at all. Um, so Rust language doesn't give you that. I think we're going to see a layering where there's this basic capability which is unsafe, and then there's ways of packaging it and making it usable by like the apps that you care about. And so this is what um, a typical SIMD algorithm might look like in just using Rust out of the box as it is today. And this is pretty heavy going. I mean, like there's a lot of stuff you can kind of see that it's subtracting multiplying, and there's all these weird types, these MM256 types. Um, 
And, uh, and then it's marked as unsafe because if you compile this code and then run it on a computer that does not have this AVX capability, then, uh, then this code will crash. So uh, kind of as an exploration, you know, I've started this crate called Fearless SIMD, which really represents an aspiration. It, it doesn't do everything, but I'm like trying to develop the audio code in my synthesizer in this style where instead of having these intrinsics that are specific to a, a particular chip and a specific data size, I've got a trait, which is SIMD F32, that represents a vector that we don't know how big it is. We don't know how wide that is. Maybe it's just F32. Maybe that's the scalar fallback. But we've got code that's parameterized on that. So no matter what actual concrete SIMD type that is, this code will call um, you know, the, the operations, and these are all overloads. Like you see, it looks kind of like ordinary math call, but this is standard ops uh, overload. So it's actually calling, you know, the add method and the, um, in this case, like round and abs or explicit methods, but you're calling methods on these SIMD types. And then kind of the magic happens in this wrapper that you've got this uh, count and map, which belong to the fearless SIMD crate. And what that's going to do is that it's going to generate code. So first of all, it's going to generate multiple instances of this generic uh, code that you gave it, this uh, quad wave function. And then it's going to generate code that, uh, that dynamically detects what CPU capabilities you have. And then it will call the specific version that you need. So you'll notice there's no unsafe in here. There's nothing that makes any assumptions about what SIMD capabilities or even what architecture you have. So like right now, I only have the x86 implementation, but I'm hoping that when I do ARM64, AH64, that you'll just be able to compile this code and you'll automatically get the right code for that chip as well. So why, why do you want this? Why do you care? Well, this is, uh, this is still early. This is just some very simple things, but these are still functions that you care about, like uh, sine wave is like a really important basic audio capability and it's, it's actually a valid synthesis technique to generate lots and lots of sine waves. Uh, so maybe you want to do that, maybe you, you want to generate thousands of sine waves so you really care how fast this runs. And then 10H is a wave shaping function, it sounds like you know, maybe an uh, analog amplifier or something like that. So these are timings of nanoseconds per audio sample. So that means that I can generate a sine wave in 470 picoseconds per audio sample. And when you're, when you're using the word picosecond to describe the performance of your code, you're, you're doing pretty good. Um, so this is maybe like 13 to 16 times better. And it's a little bit of a puzzle that, like, why is it that much better? Why are, you know, like, we only really expect four or eight. The reason is I'm comparing that against just calling the uh, standard uh, sign function in the standard library. And this is a version that is specialized for audio synthesis. And so it's not quite as precise. It's not IEEE precision. But it's like precise enough that you would never hear it. Uh, and I can also use, like, in, in the case of 10H, it's really interesting under the hood that at the heart of that is a uh, fast reciprocal square root instruction which does not exist in the scalar instruction set. It only exists in the SIMD instructions. So I'm able, it's not just a, a function of being able to use like wider vectors, but it's like once I've detected a certain capability on the chip, then I can use all of the capabilities, all of the instructions uh, at that SIMD level. So the uh, performance improvement uh, you know, that we get is actually really compelling. And as I say, like this fearless SIMD crate represents an aspiration where I want my SIMD to be written in safe code, portable, doing the detection at runtime automatically. Uh, the kind of the flip side is that the coverage of this crate is very partial, that I'm really only focusing right now on like what do I need to do audio synthesis. But I'm hoping that there are ideas in there, there's a blog post that goes into quite a bit more detail that you know I kind of want to nudge the Rust ecosystem into building these layers that let you use SIMD so that you know, this really is part of the capabilities of the platform, even if you don't really want to go in there and kind of uh, deal with individual uh, in, uh, intrinsics, uh, which is kind of what you have to do today. There are, I should also say, a couple of other really great crates out there, GGEZ, uh, no, uh, SIMD EZ and PAT SIMD that have kind of similar goals but are not as aggressive in like this 
generating multiple versions and selecting them between them uh, dynamically. That's, I think, the, the thing that is special to uh, Fearless SIMD. So kind of stepping out a little bit that, you know, I'm kind of embarked on this process of building a creative uh, artifact. I'm building a game. And, uh, you know, I'm finding, like, and you don't really think, well, of course, Rust is getting more popular in games, but, like, you know, you think of Rust as being kind of difficult uh, to use and like not, not necessarily something that sparks creativity. But I'm finding that like having those constraints, like of having to do things the right way is guiding my creative that processes. And I can think like, how do I do this? How do I structure this thing so that it's really doing the types right and getting all of these details right? And like, if I'm writing the same kind of code in C++, I'm like, is this, is this gonna, is this somehow creating undefined behavior that I haven't caught? Is this somehow, is there some way for this to go wrong? And doing it in Rust, you know, really kind of lets me focus on like the logic of the audio algorithms that I'm trying to implement or the game logic I'm trying to write. And I think ultimately this is gonna be one of the great strengths of the Rust ecosystem that it's not just about building things, but of, of building in layers, of taking pieces that there might be like a lock-free algorithm that somebody has spent a lot of time and effort to figure out the details of how do I get this right, but then you can put those together. And I think that that, that is the kind of fearlessness that is one of Rust's uh, core values of like taking these pieces and, and building. So I'm actually building a lot of different pieces of this thing. Like this talk is primarily about the uh, audio engine um, but like at the top of this thing, I'm building a game of which a synthesizer is a major component. And that synthesizer has a GUI, has a graphical user interface. And so I'm building that too. Uh, and then it's got the audio engine and then in turn the audio engine is using this SIMD. So I'd like to have a lot of community involvement um, to help build all of this uh, ecosystem. And I think to some extent, the licenses that I've chosen for the different pieces kind of speak to what kind of collaboration, you know, like how, how I expect to collaborate with other people on this stuff. The game is my personal creative expression. And I hope to sell it on Steam and maybe port it to Switch. And, um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of really successful open source collaborations on game. It does happen, but it doesn't seem to be the main way that games are built. So I'm not really looking to collaborate with people on the game logic, on the gameplay. But this core mechanic of being a synthesizer is something that I think not only does that make a lot of sense to collaborate on, but like it makes a lot of sense to package it in different ways. Like, you know, I'm building this into a game, but what if that was a VST that you could do uh, in your digital audio workstation? What if you port it to different types of hardware? And I think there's a lot of potential, and that's one of the reasons why I'm doing that as an open source project. And then once you go lower into the bits of infra infrastructure, there's lots of different things that can benefit from using that infrastructure. And so for those, I've chosen the kind of maximally uh, permissive license. So I'd like to show you a demo. This is still very much work in progress, but uh, I, I, I think that you might get an idea at least of where this is going. Um, so I'll plug in my MIDI keyboard. And uh, let's see, I probably should make the font bigger so you can see this. There we go. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something that I probably shouldn't, that I'm gonna compile this from scratch. Uh, and I'll do a release build. I mean, it actually works pretty fast with the, oh, that's not good, let me see. Sorry. There we go. Okay, that's good. Uh, hmm. Oh yeah, now you see the crates scrolling by. So this is a GUI app, and uh, it is, it's got kind of its own GUI layer. So you, now you see the little bits, like you see direct write, you see the kind of Windows infrastructure. And WIO is a crate that wraps like Windows COM objects, uh, DXGI for accessing the graphics buffer, Direct2D for doing um, graphics uh, there. And then Midier is the cross-platform MIDI that I'm using to interface to the keyboard. And uh, there we go. I think it like popped it under the window, and there we go. So this is the synthesizer, and uh, so I'll start by uh, uh, just playing. Let's see some notes. 
I'm not really going to do music or anything like that, but, uh, and then you've got these controls for things like the cutoff frequency of the filter, and you can see that also on this oscilloscope, which is an analog oscilloscope emulator, and that's also using some SIMD code, so it's emulating a kind of an electron beam that's scanning, and it's also doing SIMD code to, to do the uh, color mapping of like electron beam intensity mapped to, to colors. So that's, uh, so that part of the synthesizer is actually hard coded, but kind of the goal for this thing is a modular structure. I talk about like modules and kind of swapping them into a processing graph. And so this GUI is representing the processing graph and I can do something like drop a sine wave uh, generator and then draw a wire from that to the output. And then that generates sound and it also generates the, the tone there. And then I can take, for example, a saw. So I really just got this part of the demo working yesterday. Uh, and so there's like a lot more modules. You can, you know, break the wire on one. And then like if you want to do something like this where, you know, you want to jump over something, you can draw a jumper. And then uh, you draw that. Um, so, so this is very much work in progress, but I think it shows you a, a little bit of what I'm trying to, okay, I'll just, I'll just stop it now. Um, but like this, this shows you know the direction. This is this is like work in progress of of where I'm going with this synthesizer. Um, great. So I think that's it. And so there's a lot of links. Uh, most of this code, like everything that you've seen here, the code is just up on GitHub. Uh, I've got a blog where I talk in quite a bit more detail about these technical topics. Uh, we have, for kind of coordinating the open source uh, collaboration, I just set up a Zulip instance, which is an open source chat application that I find works really well for open source. It does things like linkify to issues and have integrations with, um, you know, Travis and stuff like that. Uh, so people are welcome to join that. Uh, you can support my open source work on uh, Patreon, although, you know, ultimately I'm hoping to make this game and make money that way, but there's like a balance of like how much time do I spend working on the game versus Rust infrastructure, and that's kind of a way to vote for that, uh, and, then, uh, and then my Twitter. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, do you have any thoughts on um, horizontal SIMD instructions for uh, fearless SIMD? Because it's, it's my experience that it's easy to get the vertical one, to build abstraction layers for the vertical instructions. But the horizontal instructions are the ones where there's a lot of variation between architectures. Mm -hmm. Some of them offer some, but not others. x86 is a total nightmare where there's like yeah. five of them, but only two of them are fast. Um, yeah. Have you given any thought to how that might work? I, I don't have the answers either. Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, so there are some horizontal instructions that are going to be easier than others. So like the easiest ones are going to be like reduce operations, like sum, which is pretty important because that's basically what you need if you're taking a dot product. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take the ones that are easy. There's this other thing where you've got these multiply ads on older versions of like SSE that have only work in certain combinations of bit widths and do weird yeah, things the, where you multiply. The unfortunate thing is I'm that I'm not going to do those. Well, the unfortunate thing is that those are the only fast ones, even on modern x86. So you have to kind of shoehorn everything into those right. if you want them so, to be fast. So basically the deal on that is that it's impossible to get kind of high performance code in the fearless style. So there is absolutely an escape hatch that says, I want to write the AVX2 version of this algorithm for x86. And then in that case, you can use, you can, there's like a, a methods in the, that SIMDF30 to trade that's like too raw. And if your raw is M256, then you can, you know, MM256, horizontal, add, multiply, weird, you know, all you like. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the. Yeah, yeah, where that's, I am right that's now. kind of what I would think too. There's not really, 
a great solution that I can think of. Yeah. But yeah, that's that uh, that's the challenge. I think part of the thinking behind this Fearless Simd Create is that for a lot of these audio style algorithms, you actually get pretty good performance with Scalar. And so, like, there's some things that you're going to do. Like, if you're writing, you know, the next, you know, AV1, and you're doing a video codec in software, you kind of don't even want that in software at all. You want hardware. But if you are going to do it on software, it's only viable if you use like the most aggressive optimization that the chip has. But for these audio algorithms, it may be like, oh yeah, you know, I could use SIMD, but you know, it's fast enough. And so if I make it really easy to use, and I feel like there's like very low hanging, Fearless SIMD is all about, take that low hanging fruit, take those algorithms that are actually fairly easy to express and just give you the tools uh, to get those. Yeah, and the nice thing is the audio, it looked like the ones you put up there were mostly vertical instructions. Those anyways. were entirely vertical, but if you look if you look at, like I have this IIR filter design, which mm -hmm. is actually really sophisticated because you don't think of IIR filters as being parallelizable. This is a blog post that's happening in the next two or three weeks. It's like, you can implement, you can evaluate an IIR filter in parallel and you can use that, uh, you can exploit SIMD in kind of interesting ways. And that's a highly non, uh, vertical uh, use of SIMD. So I'm not just working on this kind of simple map uh, type type thing. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to that blog post. Sure. So uh, continuing on the optimistic side of things and about the uh, like abstraction levels and everything, do you foresee that some of these instructions could also be implemented on a more generic level, even on compiler level, so that some of the optimizations could be leveraged even when not explicitly writing SIMD specific code? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. And so there's a couple of pieces to that. And first of all, LLVM does a really remarkably good job. If you just write code that, uh, that just does some computation on a vector, it is likely that that will al already be vectorized. But there are tricks. There are places where that doesn't work very well. And uh, so um, the other problem is that that auto vectorization only works for the architecture level that you tell the compiler. So if you're compiling code on your own machine for your own use, then you want to do dash M arch or whatever that's called, uh, the dash M native or target CPU equals native in that case. And so then you can use kind of the compiler will be aggressive and get you those instructions. But in the present state of Rust, and so this is a very complex issue because C is growing this thing called function multiversioning which lets you access those in a more automated way. And d dynamically, it's actually, in the case of function multiversioning, it's actually resolved at loader time in the kind of dynamic linking kind of metadata. It says there's actually multiple versions of this function that I could link depending that gets resolved at, at load time. Uh, and Rust doesn't have any of that infrastructure yet. Uh, so I think that there's actually a lot of room to grow. There's ways for the uh, ecosystem to get better. But in the meantime, Somebody needs to be writing explicit code to detect that version. And then the difference of like how much speed up you get based on which version you detect is in some cases quite dramatic. I didn't realize like most of the questions would be about SIMD, but. <laughs> I'll give you a different question. I saw a gain module, does it clip? Is there In the demo, I saw a module labeled gain. Does it do any clipping? Oh, the gain clipping. So no, uh, so the gain module just is just simply, uh, uh, you know, so all of the uh, computation is done with F32, which has a very wide dynamic range. Uh, so if you wanted to do clipping, you'd have a separate module for that. So there's like, it's probably, you didn't see it in the GUI, but there's like a 10H module that does soft clipping. And then there absolutely would be other modules that would do like hard clipping or, or whatever you liked. There's actually, so when I'm done with the synthesizer, there's probably going to be about 50 or 60 different modules. And there's going to be like, you know, this particular kind of resonant filter, or that particular kind of, you know, wave shaper, et cetera. <laughs> Hi, yes. Um, yeah, in a, in a similar vein, are you, you're going to be open sourcing most of the actual synthesis math that you have for that's the right. actual instruments and modules? Mm -hmm. and yes. That's amazing. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and 
Because they're all trapped in C++. Yes. Yes. Um, and a, a boring question, does this work on ARM and what kind of ARM? So the Fearless SIMD module does not yet have any ARM. When I actually uh, wrote it, I decided to stick to stable Rust. And stable Rust only supports x86 and x86-64 at this point. So there is ARM, but it's under Nightly. Um, obviously, I'm going to focus on ARCH64 uh, because uh, that's what most uh, mobile devices and the Switch use. And the Switch is probably the main compilation target that I care about. But uh, the support in LLVM for intrinsics is pretty good. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's like relatively easy to port to an ARM32. Because uh, that's interesting for like embedding into a hardware project. And I think that's potentially one of the places where this audio engine could be embedded to good, uh, to good effect. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna try this. Uh, <laughs> should we go intermediaries? They're not looking. Though. Bounce it. Okay. <laughs> hey, Rafe. Um, this is really cool. Uh, Thank you. Your stated goal is to make a game, mm -hmm. but you clearly have a lot of interest in like digital audio workstations and synthesizers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you have a, already have a GUI for your synthesizer. Yes. And I'm wondering if you also have a goal to create a legit digital audio workstation or sequencer or something like that. Um, so there's what I would like to do in an ideal world, and there is what is actually possible in any reasonable amount of time whatsoever. Um, so I'm going to basically answer the question no, that that's out of scope for what I am building. Uh, at the same time, like I feel like this has a potential to be like a pretty serious community effort with lots of people building lots of different things. And if somebody takes these pieces and puts them together to make things like a digital audio workstation, I would be ecstatic. Yeah, it sounds like a really fun project and a really cool ecosystem to build up. Thank I hope you. so. Hmm. I'm going to walk it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this project in the state that if I wanted to right now, I could just start building like an emulation of a Moog ladder filter and just start building out modules, be able to test them, and then just put them out there, here are some modules? Or is there more work that needs to be done before it's feasible to just start building modules that will still be usable in the future? If you don't mind sort of stepping over construction beams, you can start working on modules today. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, could you demo the clipping module? I don't. <laughs> Please? Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's sit down afterwards, because I would need to like edit code to do that. Okay. But I will do that for you. <laughs> Thanks you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rafe. We still have actually quite a bit of time, so feel free to hang around. There's still pizza left and some salad. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. All right.